How's it going, guys? We've got a presentation here on pitting versus non-pitting edema. Okay, very dramatic. Let's just hop through. So pitting edema means that you can apply pressure and it indents, and it's basically always bilateral, okay? So in terms of the different ideologies, cardiogenic, meaning your right heart is fucked up. Now, I just made a prior PowerPoint on right heart failure, left heart failure, congestive heart failure, core pulmonary analysis. We talk about all that stuff in more detail, but at least in a consolidated fashion for the moment, if blood can't enter your right heart, then that can lead to systemic findings such as jugular venous distension, and it's going to lead to increased hydrostatic pressure, a backup pressure of fluid in your systemic veins, which is going to lead to transidation into the interstitium. Okay, so transidation being that the fluid that is moving uh, that is extravasating is relatively devoid of cells, protein, and LDH. So it's not difficult, but you nevertheless need to know that as an answer for your simile, increased hydrostatic pressure uh, due to uh, right heart failure. Now, if we had pulmonary edema due to left heart failure, as I talked about in the other clip, it's the same thing. It's increased hydrostatic pressure, but rather than systemic veins, it's within the pulmonary arterioles and venules. So in patients who have hy systemic hypertension, the U.S. Assembly wants you to know why these patients don't automatically have peripheral edema as well as in an arterial etiology. In other words, if we just talked about how increased hydrostatic pressure in the veins due to right heart failure leads to peripheral edema and extravasation, why would it not be the case that systemic hypertension, e.g. you've got a blood pressure of 180 over 100, why wouldn't that also lead to peripheral edema if that's increased hydrostatic pressure, right? It's because before that blood reaches the capillary beds where it could extravasate, there is high pressure, there is high resistance in the systemic arterioles. So you really wants you to know that the arterioles are the major source of resistance, okay? And that's going to essentially slow down the blood so that by the time it reaches the capillaries, we have acceptable hydrostatic pressure and we don't automatically get edema. If you think it's a pedantic or nitpicky talking point, I mean, take it up with US simile. It's what they want you to know. So as I just fucking said, the arterioles are the major source of peripheral resistance, okay? And they can ask this in a number of ways. They can show you two in graph form where you're like, what are they asking me right now? So just memorize that the arterioles are the major source of resistance and that by the time blood reaches the capillary beds, the hydrostatic pressure is relatively normal. And that's why we don't get edema. Now, hepatic as the ideology, the liver for why we could get peripheral edema. Now, in cirrhosis, we're gonna have decreased albumin production. So if we have decreased protein within the blood, that's decreased intravascular oncotic pressure. So nothing to do with hydrostatic pressure, but we have decreased oncotic pressure. It's a retention pressure within the vasculature. So we can't hold on to fluid within the veins and we get extravasation into the interstitium. Okay, so we said cardiogenic, increased hydrostatic pressure. Well, with hepatic etiology for peripheral edema, it's decreased oncotic pressure. Now, if we were to ask about ascites in contrast, which can occur in the setting of cirrhosis, that would be increased hydrostatic pressure within the portal vein. So because it can't get through, the fluid can't get through the liver, Yosemite is usually not going to put you in a spot right, uh, a spot like that where they say, what's the cause of the ascites? Is it increased hydrostatic or decreased oncotic? I'm just telling you that you need to be aware of that as a tangential point where you say, okay, the peripheral edema is decreased oncotic. Ascites, it could technically be either or decreased oncotic because we don't have albumin. That makes sense. But also there's increased hydrostatic from backup at the portal system. So if they were to ask me either one, I have to be open to either one of those answers. It's a long discussion as far as if we were to go into 2CK and we talk about uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, etc. I'll make more clips on that stuff. So pitting edema and nephrogenic, so our kidneys are the ideology. Well, if we are losing protein in the urine, we have nephrotic syndrome, then similar to the liver where we have decreased albumin, we have decreased intravascular oncotic pressure and we have extravasation of transidate into the interstitial spaces, okay? So 
We said for cardiogenic, it's increased hydrostatic pressure in the veins. And then for hepatic and nephrogenic, it's going to be decreased intravascular oncotic pressure. Now we could do a 45 minute discussion of all the renal stuff. Obviously, I've got my renal PDF going into detail about all these conditions, but nephrotic syndrome, uh, you're losing generally over three grams of protein in the urine per day. You don't have to worry about strict cutoffs, doesn't matter. But minimal chain disease, obviously, probably 14 out of 15 times, it's pediatric, it's just going to be viral infection. And then the kid's got peripheral edema, uh, periorbital edema, ascites. They, and about 50% of questions, they won't even mention the viral infection. So just be aware, eight-year-old with peripheral, pedal, periorbital edema, that's just minimal chain disease. No changes on light microscopy, but on electron microscopy, you have effacement of the podocytic processes. So one out of 15 times, it can be Hodgkin lymphoma in adults. And then membranous glomerulonephropathy, many etiologies can be primary. So antibodies against phospholipase base A2 receptor it can be solid tumors, such as pancreatic, uh, breast cancer, it can be autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, okay, it can be drugs. Daxone, gold salts, sulfonamides can cause membranous glomerulonephropathy. So diabetic glomerular sclerosis. Okay, so diabetes, you're gonna get non-enzymatic acosylation of the glomerular base of membrane, and you're gonna get hyperfiltration, thickening of that glomerular base membrane, but ultimately loss of the size and charge barrier, chymal steel Wilson nodules, which are composed of hyaline, and then focal cemental glomerular sclerosis, FSGS. This is going to be the answer for nephrotic syndrome and sickle cell. So if you get a sickle cell patient with, with no blood in the urine, peripheral edema, that's FSGS. If you get a sickle cell patient with dark urine, that's renal papillary necrosis. FSGS can also be HIV and heroin use. Okay, Renal amyloidosis, 9 out of 10 times is going to be multiple uh, multiple myeloma and US simile. I've made lots of YouTube clips talking about this, talk about it in my PDFs, okay, but uh, multiple myeloma plasma cells producing aminoglobulin light chains, kappa lambda. Uh, amyloidosis is proteins depositing where they shouldn't be depositing. Well, aminoglobulins are proteins, so those proteins are flying through uh, the heart, causing uh, cardiac amyloidosis, diastolic dysfunction, fly through the kidney, cause Ben Jones proteinuria. They deposit in the renal parenchyma itself cause renal amyloidosis and nephrotic syndrome. Obviously, apple green biofringence and Congo red stain, a lot we can talk about. Drugs, okay, so amlodipine, ephedipine, diadropyridine, calcium channel blockers, especially for 2CK level stuff, family medicine, exceedingly high yield that you know these cause peripheral edema. So you'll get a patient who comes in and they've got uh, edema of their forearms and their legs, and uh, you as the med student are meeting the patient for 20 minutes before uh, he or she goes in with the doctor. And you're like, oh my God, there's edema. Could it be cardiogenic? Could it be the liver? Could it be the kidneys? Like what's going on here? OMG. And then you go present to the doctor and the doctor's like, well, did you look at, did you look at her drugs? Do you look at her drug chart? And you're like, no. Doctor pulls the drug chart up on the computer screen. And then he's like, oh, she was started on amlodipine like two weeks ago. And then he goes and sees the patient. He's like, that blood pressure pill you started, he's like, it's causing the puffiness of your forearms and legs there. We're just going to switch over your pill. And then the student's like, oh, fuck, that's right. I remember reading that, that uh, diadropyridine and calcium channel, channel blockers can cause peripheral edema. Exceedingly high yield. Uh, don't confuse with uh, verapamil, non dihydropyridine and calcium channel blocker, which can cause constipation. But uh, in case it wasn't obvious anyway, the diadropyridine and calcium channel blockers are used for hypertension. And then imatinib. Uh, is a drug that can use, be used for CML. Okay, it targets the BCRABL tyrosine kinase. A lot we can discuss. 922 translocation Philadelphia chromosome forms an oncogenic tyrosine kinase fusion protein, but imatinib uh, will target that fusion protein, and it, it's one of them, the more obscure causes of peripheral edema. You don't need to worry about the mechanisms. Just know that these two drugs can do that. Okay, so dietary doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if you're not consuming enough protein, that that could lead to uh, decrease in intravascular oncotic pressure. Okay, so that can be seen sometimes. You get uh, people who are very adamant about certain types of dietary regimens. They might be on a juice diet, etc., and they can have some peripheral edema. And then you have to, you know, very cautiously uh, articulate that it could be their diet. You know, not offend the patient, and but dietary change. Okay. So decreased dietary consumption, just, uh, don't want to exclude common things. Okay. So a little bit of peripheral edema is normal in pregnancy due to compression of the IVC. 
you need to know that and not flip out. Okay, it's very simple detail here, but you'll occasionally get that on, uh, in particular, 2CK questions, where we'll say there's some peripheral edema and the student like immediately jumps to peripartum cardiomyopathy. Not really, okay? So it's normal, okay? Uh, women can get peripheral edema in pregnancy a little bit, and you just have to make sure that they're sleeping with a pillow under their right side, okay? And um, that if she has more severe peripheral edema and dyspnea toward the end of pregnancy, or even after the pregnancy is over, then you can think of peripartum cardiomyopathy, all right? So that's an antibody-mediated process. But if there's severe dyspnea, severe peripheral edema, the vignette is emphatic about uh, that the patient is not in a good situation, then you can be thinking about peripartum cardiomyopathy. You similarly wants transthoracic echo, as the first step in diagnosis. You're looking for ejection fraction. And they want you to know it gets worse with each subsequent pregnancy and that there's increased risk of fetal demise and maternal demise with each subsequent pregnancy makes sense. If they ask you uh, which the following uh, would best suggest poor prognosis in a subsequent pregnancy, the answer is reduced ejection fraction. Not difficult, but you're not going to do a transesophageal echo. That's what you would do for things like uh, looking for vegetations with endocarditis. But you're just going to do a transthoracic echo, looking for ejection fraction. Okay, so uh, non-pitting edema means it does not indent when pressure is applied, and unlike pitting edema, it can often be unilateral. In fact, it is usually unilateral. So malignancy in general. Uh, if you have any type of lymphatic obstruction, pu de orange with inflammatory carcinoma of the breast due to Cooper's ligaments. They want you to know that Cooper's ligaments within the breast uh, can tether the skin. But you got lymphatic insufficiency, you can get this mottled appearance. But uh, any type of lymphatic insufficiency due to cancer is technically non-pitting, okay? And then, as I just said, history of you know, surgery here, such as mastectomy. Uh, that can also lead to it. There's something called Stuart Trevis syndrome, which is chronic lymphatic insufficiency due to history of mastectomy, leading to lymphangiosarcoma of the arm. It's on one of the NBME exams. If you think it's hyperpedantic, don't take up a me, take it up the NBME, okay? So if they tell you, woman had mastectomy 30 years ago, and she's had lymphatic insufficiency, and she's got purple slash red dots, violaceous dots, or growths in her anticubital fossa, and they ask what it is. The answer is just lymphangiosarcoma, and the student's like blindsided. It's like, well, I don't really know what to tell you. And even if you didn't know about Stuart Trevis syndrome ca causing lymphangiosarcoma, you can sort of infer, not so in a not so difficult way, that if there's been chronic lymphatic insufficiency, that could theoretically lead to lymphangiosarcoma. Okay. Which area Bancrofti students get hysterical about weird organisms slash diagnoses, so it's a nematode. Okay, I just put out some micro cards, micro uh, modules, but Wuchera bancropti, it's a nematode, so a roundworm, and it's spread by female mosquito. So it causes elephantiasis, can massively enlarge limb due to lymphatic insufficiency, not elephantitis. Okay, your students say elephantitis, not inflammation in the elephant. Okay, so just be aware of that as a, a lower yield cause. Thyroid. Okay, so pretibial mics edema, graves. So mucopolysaccharide deposition, the skin surrounding edema. So that's just a term you should be aware of. Obviously, you can get the um, glycosaminoglycan deposition in the eyes as well, causing protosis, ex 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 exothamos, okay, the ophthalmopathy with graves. Uh, but if they give you a question where there's hyperthyroidism and they tell you explicitly there's no pre there is no pretibial mics edema, or protosis, that's their way of saying it's not Graves, okay? So you can have other causes of hyperthyroidism, such as dequervine, okay, or toxic multinether avoider, or toxic adenoma. So it's pitting edema overall that's way more important, cardiogenic, hepatic, nephrogenic, drugs, pregnancy, okay? But non-pitting edema, lymphatic, thyroid, they're things that you should be aware of. Okay, not dramatic. Uh, not too lengthy of a clip here, but for those of you who wanted some review, there it is. Obviously, put out more clips. That's it.